welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab and this is going to sound rather strange when you look at these videos because I'm both going to keep my promise to you and break my promise to you at the same time. I've already got the fitting of this new Mark II version of my head in the video can so to speak. It's all prepared and ready to go. But as I was talking about nozzles at the end of that program and lens tubes, there were a few sort of question marks about what the recommendations should be. And so what I'm actually going to do is to talk today about nozzles and we're going to examine the problem we identified a couple of sessions ago where we're not sure how much power has been absorbed by the nozzle itself and whether or not if we open up the nozzle it will affect the cutting performance. So those are quite important issues because when you come to watch the video about this fitting of this head and all the tube options and lens options and nozzle options you will understand why I've had to go backwards and do this session first and as you can see here I'm already doing some work adapting the compound lens into this head system as well and that's for a future session. Now in the last session when we questioned whether or not, sorry not we, I questioned whether or not the beam would actually pass through the hole in the nozzle because on the information gathered from my little burn tests it was clearly showing that not all the power was passing through the hole in the end of the nozzle. As I was doing the editing at the end of the next session that I told you you will see after this one, um, when I was talking about the nozzles and the beams and the combinations of, it began to dawn on me slowly that maybe there is a reasonable explanation for this. The possibility that the manufacturers are specifying a beam width of 4mm and yet I'm finding a beam width of 12mm in this machine. There's got to be something that explains that other than the fact that the Chinese are telling lies. I did have several comments from people that suggested that maybe this was all to do with something called FWHM which stands for full wave at half maximum and it's a way of describing the feature of a, uh, a graph. It's normally applied to electronic signals and spectrum graphs in general and it did make a bit of sense but before that had even been suggested to me I reasoned that it was probably something a lot simpler than that and a lot more logical and associated with our beam and that's this. Now this is something called a normal distribution but it's also known by the term we're more familiar with, a Gaussian distribution. Now one of the things, one of the interesting properties about this distribution, if you like to break up the total width, i.e. 12 millimeters in our instance, of our beam into one, two, three, four, five, six pieces, that means we basically have two millimeters per section. Here we've got four millimetres. And within that four millimetres it's this area underneath here contains about 70 percent of the area or in other words in our case 70 percent of the power so within a 4 millimetre diameter beam, note 4 millimetres, we've got 70% of the power and that's called one standard deviation. If you go to two standard deviations, we encompass another 2 millimetres either side. So we're now at, out at an 8 millimetre beam. And when we're out at 8 millimetres, we've encompassed 95% of the power under this curve and it's not until we get to the full 12 millimeters that within a smidge 99.7 we've collected all the available power if we look at it another way all we've got left here this is 95 percent 
in fact it's more than 95%, it's nearly 96%. So what we're left with here is 2% of the power and 2% of the power in this remaining 4 millimetres of diameter. And what it shows here with these enlarged drawings at the bottom, in black, which is the central cone in each one of these pictures, we have got one standard deviation, i.e. probably the manufacturer's 4mm specification and the way in which it narrows down to the focal point and goes through the green nozzle. Okay, now two standard deviations represents, as I said, 96% of the power. And so 96% of the power, even in a case like this one and a half inch 18 millimeter diameter lens passing through a long nozzle, it's well clear of the green shape, which is the nozzle internal bore. And every one of these is now going to probably easily fit through, 96% of the power is going to fit through these nozzles. Now, as I mentioned in the previous session, the jury was out on this one because somebody at some stage must have considered how they're going to get this power through here. I had to ask the question, I found a problem and now I think I've found a solution. So I don't feel tempted to go and modify these nozzle diameters at all. I think that two and a half millimetres is going to work for anything from 1.5 as it does here right the way up to four inch and it gets better above four inches. In the same way that I started a one-man crusade to try and get the heads on these machines modified so that they're adjustable in Y and Z to make beam setting easier, I'm now, I think, probably starting on another crusade which is to add a range of engraving nozzles to these machines because whenever these machines are supplied most of you guys will have been given a long nozzle like this. Now it may have a small hole in it or it may possibly have had a large hole in it, four millimetres diameter. Either way round, these nozzles, that could be classed as more of a jack of all trades because if you put a one and a half inch lens in there it sits about five or six millimetres away from the work, as these do, and you can get a reasonable amount of air into your cut. And equally well, if you stand, if you put a two inch lens in there, it stands off about 19 millimetres and is excellent for engraving, except that a two inch lens is not really an engraving lens. It works but it's not the best lens, especially if you want to do photo engraving. So we've got this compromise. You have to, you, most of you guys, have to make do with what I call a cutting lens to do your engraving. And that's not good news. And I will demonstrate that to you a little bit later on, because I'm now just about to start a crusade to try and get nozzles that are suitable for cutting and nozzles that are suitable for engraving now this short nozzle at the moment is designed for option D here which allows you to put a one and a half inch lens into a standard what would normally be long, len long nozzle lens tube. It stubs the whole thing down so that you can get the one and a half inch sticking out the end of this nozzle but it's still a two and a half millimeter diameter hole. Now, as we've seen here, that's not a problem. All the power goes through it. But you don't normally use a one and a half inch lens for cutting. You can do if you're doing three millimeter work and you want to do some engraving at the same time, it's possible. But the problem is if you're trying to do engraving with the nozzle this close, you're going to plug up the end of the nozzle with all this brown smoke and I will demonstrate that to you shortly. What we really need is this nozzle modified so that we can use it and allow our beam to come a long way forward. 
So here we are with typically 15 to 20 millimeter space. And that is an ideal distance. The first thing that's going to happen, we're going to produce this volcanic explosion of smoke vertically upwards. And again, I hope to be able to demonstrate that to you. And, but before that happens, and it reaches the nozzle, if you've got your air management through this machine organized correctly, the high velocity air that's traveling across your work will carry this beam and smoke backwards so that it won't even get near your nozzle and it won't certainly settle down on your job and paint it brown because the airflow through this larger bore will be relatively low so my mission now is to try and establish fairly quickly what size hole I need in this short nozzle to turn it into an engraving nozzle as opposed to an inch and a half cutting nozzle. But before we start off on that mission and demonstration, the first thing we ought to do is to do a few power tests on a two inch nozzle to see what happens when we pass the beam through here. We're not expecting any dramatic results today. But we do at least need to prove the supposition that I've made here about this low percentage loss right at the outside of the beam. <clears throat> well, we're going to carry out some tests with this nozzle, um, but what I've done, I've lined the nozzle up in the centre of the doohickey, and I'm going to use the pattern that I've drawn to keep everything nice and consistent. So I'm going to drop this down well below the focal point. This is a two inch lens, so I probably need to be somewhere, I don't know, somewhere about there by the look of it. And I can set my disc on there, like that, and see whether we're still approximately in the middle with a pulse. Yeah, we're not far out, so that'll be okay. 21.4. Now we'll run the test, get to the outside and it'll turn on and run around the pattern. I can guarantee that all the heat is going to stay on the pack then. Minus. Fifty point eight. Fifty point eight equals times two. Don't worry about the sign. Fifty eight point eight. Well, here's the results for the two inch lens, and it's one of the reasons why I have slipped this video in front of the head transplant because I want you to understand exactly what these nozzles are doing before you make a decision about what you want to buy if you're going to make one of these yourself. Very interesting data that we've got now. Okay so what this information tells me is I've got 62 watts coming down here without a lens in. As soon as I put the lens in the power after the lens drops to 57.8 watts and then after a standard 2.5 nozzle I'm getting 56.8 watts. I've lost one watt in 50. 2% ish. Not worth worrying about. And when I open it up to 3.5 as this picture says I should do then I get no change. I'm still getting 56.8 watts. So why would I open up and compromise my airflow when I'm getting no benefit from it. So as I suspected when I did the previous session on nozzles, yeah it's very interesting but they've been around a long time. They have to be that size and that shape for some good reason. Now they work well for cutting which is where you need all this power 
I've chosen the two inch lens because that is typical of what most of you guys have on your machine. Now the one and a half inch lens might give slightly more exaggerated results, but looking at this data here, I don't think we're going to see any major changes even on a one and a half inch lens going through a 2.5 orifice. Right, now I'm going to set up for engraving. I'm not going to go into every aspect of engraving today. I'm just going to go through a few basics to show you the problem that you've got with this particular nozzle. So that's a four millimeter gap. We'll take a look at the results. There we go, look, you can see there's a nice crisp line along the top there. And you can't actually see any dots along the bottom row. If you could see through this eyeglass properly, there are nearly dots. Now I don't think I should be able to get much better than that. I'm going to assume that I've got 0.2 dots. Now I know that I haven't got 0.2 dots, they're coarser than that. But that is a 127 pixels per inch and it's broken down into 127 dots per inch dithered picture. With a dot picture you're, I'm going to be able to demonstrate much clearer um, the problem with engraving. Now with this picture you will note where I've got the head starting right down at the center and the bottom here. There's two reasons for that. Number one being on center makes it very easy to center your picture on any material that you want to use and number two by starting from the bottom hopefully we're going to drag the smoke backwards before we engrave the picture so that we're not going to leave brown debris on the picture we're going to leave a clean picture behind <laughs> Now you can see the way in which the flame is going upwards. Let's turn the fan on now. Now the only reason you can see what looks like a flame going upwards is because that is the smoke that's exploding off of the surface of the wood being ejected upwards like a volcano and as it goes upwards the laser beam is coming downwards and it's setting fire to the particles it's overheating the particles making them burn but I can see that in feel in places it's a bit 3D round the eyes so I know that the pixels have been overlapping and they've overburnt in those areas but the, it's not the picture that I'm worried about today it's those little explosions that take place every time the dot occurs every time the laser starts up it's the same black explosive uprush of fumes that occurs when you start a cut off. You will remember how we get this little explosive brown mark here at the beginning of each cut where the laser beam has got nowhere to send its fumes except upwards. Only when we get the cut established all the way through is there somewhere for the smoke to go and the right place for the smoke to go is out the bottom and that is how we manage to get a nice clean cut by pushing all the smoke downwards. What we're doing here is exactly the opposite. I suspect that if I look at this nozzle, although we haven't done very much and we haven't been using much power, but already, look, you can see on the surface of that nozzle this brown, sticky debris from doing such a little job as that. It won't take long for that nozzle to get really sticky and clagged up. But what we need to do is check whether or not our low air assist has protected the lens. And the answer to that question is yes. Now how do we overcome this problem? I've already got half the secret to engraving built into this machine. And that is a solid table. There is nowhere for the air to go in this machine except through the front door here, which remember is closed normally, 
but I don't close it, I leave a one inch gap. It flows through here, there, and straight out over the back of the table there. So I've got a cross flow in the machine. Now what we're going to do is add to that cross flow something else. Now I've got a rather special nozzle here that I've created. I'm in the process of developing a standard nozzle that will fit on there that will also take a compound lens assembly. So you will probably soon be able to purchase this as a complete compound lens assembly. But I doubt whether I have this piece of material on it. I shall find some other way to do it. At the moment it's got a hole in the side here but that's above the lenses so I've got to make sure that my air assist comes down below the lenses. Now today I'm going to be able to use this instead of my lens being in this lens tube I'm going to take that same lens which is a 20 millimeter lens I'm going to try and pop it on the top there now the advantage of doing what I've done there is that I should be pulling that lens forward by probably 8 or 10 millimeters now this is where you can play tunes with this lens ring I've got a lens ring set back there and on top of the lens ring I've put an o-ring this is a split o-ring so that it comes out nice and easily but it performs the same function of cushioning the lens. So what I'm now trying to do is to set this lens in here because bear in mind I've got a two millimeter clamp face that I've got to take into account when I put this into my machine. So I've got to get this so that it clamps up the lens and leaves just under, a fraction under, a two millimeter gap there. Just bite. Now I'll carry on tightening up just a little bit and now it's locked into here as well. 26 millimeters is looking good for a two inch lens, that is. Now I'm going to close the lid again because I want the air to flow from front to back of the machine. Can you see those flames reaching the nozzle? by the way and you will see there's not a hint of any debris on that nozzle it will stay perfectly clean well I think that's probably cleared up a few issues for when you watch the next session we certainly don't need to do anything with the size of our cutting nozzles although we do need to consider what we should do with our engraving nozzles which to be honest don't exist at the moment but give it a few weeks and I'm sure you will be able to buy an engraving nozzle when that becomes possible I will let you know so now you can go ahead and do your head transplant mark 2 with a certain amount of confidence I feel happy that I've given you information that when you find something that's a bit dubious in the next session you'll be able to refer back to this one and say well yeah, he was worrying unnecessarily so thanks again for your time and I'll catch up with you in the next but one session.